Hey, students and educators, how often do you find yourself staying up hours into the night, scrounging through all corners of the internet to keep up with all of the cybersecurity news for assignments and lectures, only to wonder if it's good or bad information? Nobody has time for that. CyberWire Pro can lighten that load by bringing you a concise synthesis of the things you need to know. Many educators even use Pro as part of their course curriculum, so their students can better understand topics relative to the class. The best part? Both students and educators qualify to receive a deep discount on a CyberWire Pro subscription, so you'll be saving time and money, all while sustaining your cybersecurity awareness and education. Contact us to receive your exclusive discount at thecyberwire.com slash contact us. That's thecyberwire.com slash contact us. Goblin Pandas upped its game in recent attacks on Vietnamese government targets. The EU is investigating cyber attacks against a number of its organizations. Scraped LinkedIn data is being sold in a hackers forum. Facebook talks about the causes of its recent data incident. A new Android malware poses as a Netflix app. Joe Kerrigan shares comments from the new head of the NCSC. Our guest is Fang Yu from Datavisor with highlights from their digital fraud trends report. And the mole rats are using voice changers to fish for IDF personnel. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. Kaspersky researchers describe a new and, in their view, sophisticated remote access Trojan being used in a Chinese cyber espionage campaign against the Vietnamese military and other government targets. ThreatPost reports that the malware used, called FoundCore, is unusually evasive and that it's associated with the CycleDeck threat actor, also known as APT-27 or Goblin Panda. That specific attribution is tentative, But the rat itself, Kaspersky says, constitutes a significant step up in terms of sophistication for this sort of activity, adding that the tool chain presented here was willfully split into a series of interdependent components that function together as a whole. The researchers also caution against assuming that the group's focus on Vietnamese targets means that no one else needs to be concerned with it. As the report concludes, quote, Experience shows that regional threat actors sometimes widen their area of activity as their operational capabilities increase, and that tactics or tools are vastly shared across distinct actors or intrusion sets that target different regions. Today, we see a group focused on Southeast Asia taking a major leap forward. Tomorrow, they may decide they're ready to take on the whole world. According to Bloomberg, several European Union bodies came under cyber attack last week. Who precisely was affected is unclear, as is the threat actor responsible, but a European Commission representative said that thus far no major information breach was detected. The incident remains under investigation. Onapsis and SAP have warned of a campaign actively taking advantage of vulnerabilities in SAP mission-critical software. SAP has issued patches for all of these, and users are advised to take prompt action. Data allegedly scraped from some 500,000 LinkedIn profiles is being offered for sale in a hacking forum, with 2 million records displayed as confirmation that the sellers have the goods they say they do, Cyber News reports. It's unclear whether the data is newly obtained or simply represents an aggregation of material from past breaches. In other data scraping news, Facebook has published a commentary on the recent dump of its users' data. Menlo Park wants to make it clear that its systems weren't compromised, but rather that the data now offered for free were obtained through scraping. Their explanation reads, in part, quote, We believe the data in question was scraped from people's Facebook profiles by malicious actors using our contact importer prior to September 2019, 
This feature was designed to help people easily find their friends to connect with on our services using their contact lists. When we became aware of how malicious actors were using this feature in 2019, we made changes to the contact importer. In this case, we updated it to prevent malicious actors from using software to imitate our app and upload a large set of phone numbers to see which ones matched Facebook users. Through the previous functionality, they were able to query a set of user profiles and obtain a limited set of information about those users included in their public profiles. The information did not include financial information, health information, or passwords. End quote. Checkpoint describes Android malware that misrepresents itself as a Netflix content enabler, Flix Online. It's distributed via malicious auto-replies to incoming WhatsApp messages, and, once installed, enables the attacker to distribute phishing attacks, spread false information, or steal credentials and data from users' WhatsApp accounts. Why would you install Flix online? To watch TV, obviously. But the hoods sweeten the deal with a social engineering come on. Quote, Two months of Netflix premium free at no cost for reason of quarantine, coronavirus. Get two months of Netflix premium free anywhere in the world for 60 days. Get it now, here. With a link provided, naturally. Once installed, the malware asks for three permissions. Overlay, which allows it to create new windows on top of other applications. Checkpoint explains that this is usually requested by malware to create fake login screens for other apps with the aim of stealing victims' credentials. Ignore battery optimizations, which keeps the malware running when it would otherwise be shut down as idle by the device's battery-saving routine. And finally, it asks for notification access, specifically the notification listener service. This is valuable because it enables actors to automatically perform actions, including dismissing and replying to messages. Checkpoint explains, quote, if these permissions are granted, the malware then has everything it needs to start distributing its malicious payloads and responding to incoming WhatsApp messages with auto-generated replies. Theoretically, through these auto-generated replies, a hacker can steal data, cause business interruptions on work-related chat groups, and even extortion by sending sensitive data to all the user's contacts. End quote. And finally, the mole rats are back and seem to have upped their game a bit as they continue to catfish for Israeli military personnel. The Mole Rats are also known as the Gaza Hackers Team, Gaza Cyber Gang, Dusty Sky, Extreme Jackal, or Moonlight. Researchers at Cato Security say that the Palestinian-associated group, which they accord a middling grade for sophistication, is using voice-changing software in social engineering calls, during which they pose as women seeking to approach Israeli Defense Forces personnel. As Cato points out, the known members of the Mole Rats are all actually men. So, IDF, a pro tip, the women you think you are talking to are probably really dudes. Not that there's anything wrong with that, some of us around here are dudes too, but you should probably kick the tires on that virtual relationship before things get out of hand. And now, a message from our sponsor, Fortrace. If you've recently been asking yourself questions like, how long do I bake a lasagna? Or, where did I leave my keys? They cannot help you. However, if you've been asking yourself questions like, are threat actors actively phishing me or my vendors? Or, how can I ensure third parties haven't leaked any of my proprietary information? Then, Fortrace can help. Fortrace implements the same reconnaissance tools and techniques employed by red teams and real cyber adversaries, providing you the most authentic possible view of an organization's digital footprint, showing you only what the bad guys can actually see. Whether you're an organization looking to assess and monitor your third party's digital hygiene or a managed service provider looking to monitor the external exposure of your clients, Fortrace has the right tool for the job. Visit their website at F-O-R-E-T-R-A-C-E dot com to learn more about their offerings. That's Fortrace dot com. And we thank Fortrace for sponsoring our show.
The team at anti-fraud security firm Datavisor recently published their Digital Fraud Trends Report. Fang Yu is CTO and co-founder of Datavisor. Yeah, so as a data advisor, uh, we globally protect 4 billion user accounts and we uh, protect a lot of like large institutions for virus um, fraud attack. And then we produce um, fraud report um, every year. So um, it's, this fraud report is especially interesting because it covered the period of a pandemic, which is actually new to uh, um, us. Um, so we actually provide quite some interesting insight from the behavior change of both foster and normal user during the pandemic period. What um, sort of advice do you have for folks to best protect themselves against this? So there, um, if you look at um, the, the fraud trend, right, um, the providers um, in financial institutions, I think the fraudsters are coming back um, in high uh, attack waves. So um, I think the, the, the message is that it, it is true that the fraud went down quite a bit during the pandemic period, but now it's actually coming back. For um, for the e-commerce, et cetera, and the social platforms, we see a spike uh, last year, and we expect continue to see that. And then the one of the things we are seeing from um, the fraud trend is that the fraud is actually going more and more sophisticated. And then especially in terms of the um, uh, two areas, one is account takeover. Um, so many, uh, we will see 79 to 90% of the financial fraud attacks are uh, originated or are associated with account takeovers. So account takeover is especially hard <laughs> for like a remote, right? Everybody now is actually remote, uh, uh, not actually going to the branch, going online, etc. So everyone needs to be very, very careful with their customer's account not being uh, taken over. The second actually uh, w- advice I would give is actually pay very much uh, attention to the attacks from mobile. Although the mobile fraud rate is still much, much lower than the uh, fraud rate from desktop, for example. The fraud rate from the mobile platform is only 0.5 versus the, the fraud rate from desktop is 7.4. But that uh, percentage is actually going up. And I also want to emphasize that the fraud rate from the the mobile platforms are usually those very, very sophisticated ones because they to, to, to conduct a desktop attack, it's actually much more easier than you can actually have a program. But for attack farming from mobile, you need to rook the device, you can jailbreak, you can hook, you put something there. But it's actually very, very powerful. Many people actually think uh, the mobile device is very low fraud. They actually let it through with less screening. But once an attacker actually find a ways to how to attack from mobile, they can quickly um, uh, like uh, spin up many, many different devices. They can put emulators, they can put things. So the attack wave can be much bigger because nobody is actually um, very prepared for that. That's Fang Yu from Datavisor. And now, a word from our sponsor, Verizon. Mitigate the risks and realize the benefits of digital transformation with the help of Verizon, a leader in cybersecurity managed and professional services for nearly two decades. From secure cloud computing solutions to advanced detection and response capabilities, Verizon helps secure data, networks, and infrastructure of many of the world's best-known organizations. Their annual Data Breach Investigations Report is considered the gold standard of cybercrime research. And Verizon's leadership in network, wireless, and IoT connectivity makes it uniquely capable of protecting the ever-expanding attack surface. Let Verizon help you optimize your defenses and achieve the maximum return on your security investments. Learn more at verizonenterprise.com slash products slash security. And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute and also my co-host on the Hacking Humans podcast. Joe, great to have you back. Hi, Dave. Uh, A couple of articles over on ZDNet. These are written by Danny Palmer. And uh, he's been tracking the fact that uh, over in the UK, the NCSC has uh, a new sheriff in town to to mix uh, 
uh, national metaphors, I suppose. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, 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 who do we have here, Joe? Dave, her name is Lindy Cameron, and she is the new CEO of the National Cybersecurity Center. Mm. And uh, the article that caught my eye here was hacked companies. This is the headline. Hacked companies had backup plans, but they didn't print them out before the attack. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oops. Yep. <laughs> Uh, this is something I've said multiple times, I believe, on this show and it, possibly over on Hacking Humans. But, you know, when you, when you go through the trouble of making a, a business continuity plan and a recovery plan and, you know, let's think about what's going to happen if we get hit by ransomware. Well, we've got the plan. It's all right here. But if you don't have that printed out, um, mm-hmm. it's going to be encrypted when you get hit with a ransomware attack. <laughs> right, right. So right. Have, it, have it on a binder on a shelf. Right? right, have it on a binder on a shelf. There is, the paperless office is a myth. Um, it's, it's never going to happen. We're going to need to keep uh, paper because it's, it's really hard to, to hack paper. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that, that people say is you can't Google paper, uh, which is true. You really can't run a search engine on paper without first you know, turning it back into a digital media, which uh, is really un- an unnecessary step. But it is a critical step if your data is destroyed or damaged. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be addressed. One of the things uh, – she has a quote in here. I've talked to organizations which have walked in on Monday morning to find they can't turn their computers on. The backup plan was not printed out, so they couldn't find a phone number. Mm-hmm. Um, right. If you're doing business continuity planning, you should have a telephone tree uh, for your for your business continuity plan printed out and put on a shelf somewhere. Uh, this is actually something I've taken part in years ago. Uh, mm. Actually, before I was involved in, uh, you know, made a career shift to a cybersecurity organiz- uh, organizations, I was involved in uh, working on business continuity plans with with the company. And mm. one of the things that we did was develop a, a phone tree list and print that list out. And the reason we were thinking about that wasn't so much for ransomware, because this was back in the early 2000s, but it was for a uh, natural disaster, right? It's mm-hmm. th- still the same problem. Uh, you have... You've lost access to your to your systems because they're gone. They don't physically exist anymore. So you need to have a way to uh, access that information. And the only way that we could come up with and the most cost-effective way is just print it out. Print it out and keep a copy of it. Yeah. I would add, too, that um, don't count on your corporate phone system to be working, right? That's right. I mean, yeah. you, that could yeah. be part of the, the, uh, the ransomware grab or... Uh, or in, in case of a, a natural disaster, something like that, you, you know, have have people's personal mobile phone numbers as part of that tree as well. Yeah, that's an absolutely excellent su- suggestion, Dave. Uh, you're one hundred percent correct because it, these your your corporate phone system is probably computer system based now, and mm-hmm. it is just as easy to bring that down as it is to take your your ser- your network of servers down. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, uh, a good quote from Ms. Cameron here is, there is no doubt that organizations that have experienced, and she by that she means a ransomware attack, have a much more visceral sense of what it feels like to experience a ransomware attack or a cyber attack, and therefore, they're better prepared. I'm reminded of a child that touches a hot pan, right? You mm. know, when you when your kids were young, you'd say, "Don't touch the hot pan, don't touch the hot pan." But they had to touch the hot pan at some point in time, right? <laughs> right. I distinctly remember this as a kid when I did this. I can tell you exactly where it happened. It was at a Roy Rogers and Olney, and there was a sign that said "hot," and I was like, "Well, but let's see what happens." And you know, I was <laughs> very young, and sure enough, burned my finger. Right? I, yeah. I, yeah. I tell a great story about my daughter with this, but you know what? I don't go around touching hot things anymore. Neither does my yeah. daughter. Neither does any kid that's ever touched something hot. They <laughs> they learn that lesson, and this is exactly yeah. exactly the same thing. The people who have been through these cybersecurity attacks, they have an absolutely clear understanding of how bad it is, so right. they prepare for it to protect themselves. And boardrooms that haven't been through this are probably less prepared. I think this is a this is a great observation on her part. Yeah, they also point out that um, the uh, NCSC has some tools that they offer up. One of them is called Exercise in a Box. That's right. That's a great um, idea. Yeah, and you know, I, I think we've covered this as well. That you know, you you need to practice like you play. To use that old sports metaphor, that mm-hmm. these tabletop exercises, these simulations, um, you know, that that is going to put you in a much better place than just 
reading through the plan, you right. know, to, to Absolutely. actually no. go through and say, to have someone there and say, okay, uh, none of the phones work. Now, now what are you going to do? Right. You know, okay. Yep. You know, you can't, you can't access these files. Now, what are you going to do? Okay. The press is calling. What's your response going to be? How quickly you're going to, you know, it, so to, to, to feel that heat, right. Yes. <laughs> that, that's going to put you in a much better place. Those kind of uh, exercises are absolutely invaluable. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, uh, and, and not only that, but you can actually do, uh, you know, you can have, hold these exercises like annually or semi-annually, or maybe even quarterly, if you, if you like, uh, to yeah. make sure that your team that has to handle this is prepared. The, the exercises take less than a day. Everybody can come together. I think it, it, it pays dividends in the future. Uh, but you can also just do on a weekly basis. Uh, we've talked about this before, grab a newspaper, look at one of the cybersecurity headlines and go, what do we do if this happens to us? Mm -hmm. And just have people think about it weekly, you know, make, make sure that people are, are aware and in that mindset so that when, when things happen, they at least have the neural pathways uh, already in place to understand what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, a couple articles over on ZDNet written by Danny Palmer. Uh, so do check those out if you're interested. Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for CyberWire Pro. It'll save you time and keep you informed put a little distance between yourself and the crowd. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker, too. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a message from our sponsor, the Hacker Valley Studio Podcast. Cybersecurity isn't the only field that has adversaries, strategy, and opportunities. Join Ron and Chris on the Hacker Valley Studio Podcast, where they explore the human condition to inspire peak performance in cybersecurity. In each episode, you can expect to hear from experts in and out of the field. They believe cybersecurity practitioners are mental athletes with no off-season. And the guests on the show are your coach, focused on bringing out the best in you in every episode. Learn more about Hacker Valley Studio Podcast by visiting hackervalley.com. Let's get better together, and we'll see you on the next episode. And we thank Hacker Valley Studio Podcast for sponsoring our show.